Mantle swings and what a drive! Man, it's racing over and he grabs it for a spectacular catch. How about can the Yankees win another World Series? I joined a team that won five straight World Series. I mean, uh, everybody talked about the uh, Bronx Bombers, but we had Reynolds, Rashi, Lopat, Ford, uh, Joe Page in the bullpen. It was just an unbelievable team. And I was hitting Pepper one day to about three guys, and this guy was walking behind them, and I hit one kind of hard, you know, and it, whoever was supposed to catch it, it didn't catch it, and it hit the guy in the shins right on the leg, you know, and he turned around and looked, and it was Joe DiMaggio. That was the first time I ever saw Joe DiMaggio. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, I mean, I'll hit, I'll hit my man. Because at that, well, I still, he still is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, probably the greatest all-around baseball player to ever live. They've done it again. We have fourth World Series in a row. And to win uh, four uh, championships as far as World Series is concerned, I would have to say that this year, was a terrific World Series to have to win. Casey become almost like a father to me, you know. Um, I told a story a, a few times about when I got sent out in 1951. Uh, Casey let me get dressed with the rest of the guys. We were in Detroit. We just got to Detroit, and I'd had a really terrible series up in Boston. He let me get dressed with the rest of the guys, go out on the field. Then he called me back into the clubhouse, sent the clubhouse man out and got me and brought me back in to tell me alone with himself, you know. And um, he had tears in his eyes, and of course, it broke my heart, you know. But uh, yeah, he was like a father to me. He, he always called me my boy. That, that's my boy there, you know. And another time, uh, another time, I'll never forget, Casey called uh, me and Billy and Whitey into the office. And uh, they, they even had, uh, at this time, they even had uh, like Gallo would come out with one of his uh, cartoons, you know, and it showed me and Billy and Whitey standing in front of Casey like Casey was dressed up like a judge behind a desk, you know, and we're standing there and like Billy's got a BB gun and I got a, a Winnie, uh, what's those, a beanie flipper or whatever they call them, uh, and uh, Whitey had something behind him, you know, and it, like the dead end kids or somebody like that, and Casey was balling us out. And about that same time is when uh, Casey called us into the office one day, and he was telling us uh, this. You never know how he's going to be, you know. And, you, and he did scare you. When he called you in the office, he could scare you. I mean, he could get really serious. But this time I'll never forget because it was a funny story. He said, do uh, you guys know who King Solomon was? And we all go, no, not really, you know. <laughs> We're looking at each other trying to figure out what's he talking about, you know. He said, well, King Solomon was uh, a guy that, said uh, he had a hundred wives or so. So when you got a hundred wives, they can't all live in the same house with you. They've got to be scattered around, you know. So they're scattered all over town. 
said, but if you've got all these wives, so you, he, he couldn't go get them, so he had a guy that lived with him that would run and get the wife and bring it. If he had one away across town and he wanted, this guy had to run and get her and bring her over, no matter what time of night, if two, or, two or three o'clock in the morning, this guy had to run and get her. So, well, King Solomon lived to be 100 years old. So do you know this guy that was running and getting these wives? So he died when he was 30 years old. So we're all looking at each other, you know. He said, you don't know what that proves? He said, that just proves that the partying and the drinking and everything, that's not what kills you. It's that running after it. It's what doing it. Keith, who's going to win this series? Well, that's up to you. You tell me. Uh, anybody else that's around. I can't judge this, what's going to happen. I might get 25 line drives right out of man in right field and he'd catch all 25. I can't judge the results of a series. I know what uh, we think in our heart and in our mind that uh, we have a very good ball club and should win the series. There was a committee in Washington called the Kefauver Committee, and they was trying to prove that baseball was antitrust or something like that. I never did know what it was, but I was scared to death. Uh, they had uh, Casey and Del Webb and myself come from the Yankees, and they had Stan Musial and Ted Williams. Uh, we go down there the night before. We get up early the next morning. All the way down there, Del Webb is just saying, hey, relax, you know, because I was really scared. I was afraid I was going to get thrown in prison or something. I didn't know. Anyway, uh, we got down there, and the first guy that they swore in was Casey. And they asked him, did he think that uh, baseball was antitrust or whatever it was, whatever the question at that time was. And uh, he started in by saying, I started playing baseball in Kankakee, Illinois, back in like 1800 or whatever he said. I don't know what it was. But anyway, he talked for like an hour and a half or so. I don't know what it, he was really putting the sting lease to him that day. Well, I'll tell you, I got a little concerned yesterday in the first three innings when I saw that my three players that I'd gotten rid of, I said, well, if I lose nine, what am I going to do? And when I had a couple of my players that I thought so great of that didn't do so good up to the sixth inning, I was more confused, but I finally had to go and call on a young man in Baltimore that we don't own, and uh, the Yankees don't own him, and he's doing pretty good, and I would actually have to tell you that I think we're more the Greta Garbo type. Now, from success, we are uh, being hated. I mean, from the ownership and all, we're being hated. Every sport that gets too great, or one individual, and they finally asked him to step down, you know, and, uh, and then they swore me in. I was next. And uh, Senator Keith Faber says, Mr. Mantle uh, said, uh, what, are, what do you think? Uh, do you think baseball is antitrust or whatever? And I said, uh, sir, I, I don't really know that much about it, but I said, everything that Casey said, I agree with. And uh, he, everybody laughed, you know. He said, well, Mr. Mantle, would you mind telling us what, what, what Mr. Stingle said? <laughs> The chips are down at Ebbets Field. The Yanks and Dodgers have run out the string. This is the seventh and decisive game of the 52 series. This is it. Robinson pops it up out around the mound. Joe Collins doesn't see it, but here comes Benny Martin, and he makes the catch, and the Yankees win. Beep, beep, five, five, four, four, four. I smell smoke in the auditorium. Charlie Brown. Everybody always picking on me. Well, Billy was uh, Billy was always a great one for jokes. You know, I mean, he uh, he loved to uh, pull a joke on somebody. He get a bigger kick out of that than anybody that I've ever played with. He had one of those pins like Joe DiMaggio come to the to the ballpark in a suit and tie every day. I mean, we'd come out in Levi's and tennis shoes or anything like that. But Joe was dressed always, and Billy had one of those pins. You know, that he run up and say, Joe, sign this ball. You know, and it was one of those pens that throws inks on all over you, on Juicy. My God, how could you have done that? Who's always writing on the wall? Who's always pooping in the hall? And this one day in Boston, uh, we finished our day game, and Billy and I went out to eat. And the next thing I know, it's like uh, 10 till 12. And we got to be back in the Kenmore 
and uh, we think if we really hurry, we can make it. Well, we get, get in traffic or something. Anyway, we get back to the Kenmore about 5 or 10 after 12, and we're running up the steps to the front door, and here's Casey in the lobby with about 10 or 12 riders. You know, as long as somebody would, a rider would stand around and listen, Casey would talk to him. So we go around to the back door, and the door's locked. But the transom, about a story up, is open. And Billy says, look, if you get me up on your shoulders, I can jump up and get into that window, and I'll come around and open the door for you. So he gets into the window, you know. I got a brand new shark skin suit on. I really liked it, you know. He's crawling all over me. I had to stand on a on one of those trash cans out in the back alley there to get him on my shoulder to get him into the window. So he gets up uh, on in, into the window, comes around. I can hear him inside trying to get open the door. And then I don't hear him for a while. I, I'm... All of a sudden, I see him back up at the window, and he goes, Hey, Meg. Yeah, he says, listen, he said, that, door, that door's got a chain and a lock on it. I can't get it open. I'll see you tomorrow. Now, I'm still standing out in the alley, right? I have to stack all those trash cans up and try to get up on them and get into that window. I must have fell off of them about four or five times. That shark skin suit had lettuce and oh, all kinds of garbage all over it, you know. I finally got into the window and got to the room. He was in there asleep. Who's always throwing spit balls? Yes, who? Who, me? Yeah, you. So this story is about this, the, uh, when the, the Giants moved to San Francisco and they had the All-Star game in San Francisco and me and Whitey went out early. Whitey had a terrible time getting Willie Mays out. He just, I think Willie's lifetime average was over 400 against Whitey. Anyway, we wanted to go play golf. We got there the day before the All-Star game, you know, and so Whitey called Horace Stone him up and asked him if we could play at his country club. And he said, sure, just sign everything, you know. He said, in fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you just sign everything. If you get Willie out in the All-Star game tomorrow, I'll take care of everything. If you don't, you have to pay for it. And we, I mean, we run up a bill, like $400 or something like that. So anyway, I'm telling why I'm saying, man, if you get him out tomorrow, I'll buy your dinner or anything, you know. Sure enough, Whitey, I think, threw him a spitter or something, struck him out. And it was one of the few times he ever got Willie out. But anyway, the, it was the last out of the inning, too. And everybody was saying, I was jumping up in the air and the outfield. I come running off and grabbed Whitey, you know, like it was the World Series. Never, nobody can figure it out but Horace Stoneham. Walks in the classroom, cool and slow. Who calls the English teacher daddy oh Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown, he's a clown. You know, uh, everybody asks me, now, I've never seen him fight. I've never seen Billy have a fight. Why is everybody always picking on me? Well, one of the stories that everybody wants to know about, it seems like, is the old Copacabana incident. It was in 1957. It was Billy's birthday, so it had to be in May. And uh, me and Whitey gave him a birthday party, and we invited Yogi and his wife Carmen, Hank Bauer and his wife Charlene, uh, me and Merlin and Whitey and his wife Joni, uh, a couple more of the, uh, the Yankees and their wives. And we took them uh, all down to Denny's Hideaway, which was uh, an old favorite place of mine and Billy's. And we uh, had a couple of drinks down there and then a something, you know, some steaks or something. Then we had a few more drinks. Anyway, by the time it was getting around 10 o'clock, about the, the 10 o'clock show at the Copa was getting ready to start, so we said, why don't we go down and catch Sammy Davis, you know? So we all go down there, and they give us a big table, you know, in the middle of the room. And about, we had a couple of drinks, I guess, there. And about that time, here come two bowling teams in uh, that had both won their divisions in the bowling alley, something, and they was all feeling pretty good, too. Anyway, they got to talking kind of loud and, getting on to Sammy or something, and I think I think it might have been Hank said, uh, hey, come on, you guys, cool it a little bit. We got our wives here, and you're embarrassing them, you know. Well, one thing led to another, and somebody said, uh, well, just meet us around here at the corner. Of course, you don't have to tell Billy but once, you know. I mean, uh, and Hank also. Uh, so next thing I know, the cloakroom is full of people, and everybody's swinging and throwing punches and everything. Uh, some next thing, and then there's a guy laying right at my feet. I'm in the back end of the thing there, and I'm just standing there. I'm watching everything. You know, I never did hit anybody or anything. I didn't get hit or anything, but somebody had hit a guy because he's laying at my feet, and I thought it was Billy at first, and I picked his head up, and I saw it wasn't Billy, so I dropped it back down. But 
anyway, uh, the next day when we went to the ballpark, the headlines was Yankees in Copa fight and all that, Billy Martin, this and that. Uh, just as soon as we got to the ballpark the next day, Billy Martin started packing his bags in the, in the clubhouse. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm gone. I said, George Weiss just looking for a chance to get rid of me anyway, you know. And uh, he had warned us a few times about missing planes and trains and stuff like that. And uh, sure enough, later on that year, uh, we go to Kansas City, and Billy got traded. But before that happened, I'll go. I'll tell you the, the one of the funniest parts of the whole thing was the uh, one of the guys. I guess the guy that got hit so hard uh, sued Hank Bauer for I don't know how much. But anyway, we all had to go to court, and I'd never been in court before. And in fact, I think that's the only time I've ever been on a witness stand in my life. Uh, they asked Hank questions and Whitey questions and Billy questions and everything, and they finally called me up to the witness stand, and I was sitting there, and the judge looks over at me and said, Mr. Mantle said, do you have gum in your mouth? I said, yes, sir. I was scared to death, you know. He said, well, would you do something with it? So I took it out of my mouth. I don't know what to do, you know. I said, I just stuck it under the uh, chair there, you know. So he said, well, would you tell us what happened? I said, well, I don't know, Your Honor. I, I was kind of in the background there. I was standing in the back, and I see this guy laying at my feet, and I picked him up, and I looked at him. It looked like Roy Rogers rode through there on Trigger, and Trigger kicked him in the face. And uh, everybody got a big kick out of that, and the judge says, case dismissed. He's gonna get caught. Just you wait and see. Why is everybody always picking on me? And sure enough, later on that season, 57, uh, we go to Kansas City to play Kansas City, and they traded Billy to Kansas City uh, while we was there. And uh, that was one of the blackest days of my life. I mean, I was, me and him and Whitey went out that night, and we, we uh, went out to souse it up that night. I mean, it wasn't, there was no doubt about it. I mean, we was crying on each other's shoulders and everything. I'd been room, he'd been my only roommate uh, since uh, I came to the Yankees, you know, and then, and me and Billy and Whitey were like, I have two or uh, three brothers, and they weren't any closer than Billy and Whitey was to me. And whenever they broke us up, it just, uh, it really tore us up, to tell you the truth. And I remember that Whitey was pitching the next day, and uh, he, he was staying right there with it. He stood with me and Billy for a long time. Finally, he said, I've got to go to bed. I'm going to pitch, you know. But he said, I'll tell you what. He said, if I stand straight up tomorrow, it's a fastball, and if I bend over, it's a curve. He told Billy, you know, and he, but he said, don't hit a home run off of me, you know. Billy said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, you know. Sure enough, uh, Whitey threw him. I don't know uh, if it was a fastball or a slow curve or what it was, but Billy knew what was coming. And I'll be darned if he, Billy don't hit a home run, you know. And all the way around the bases, he's laughing like hell, you know. The next time up, Whitey knocked him down. Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown, he's a clown. So everywhere I go, people always ask me, uh, what makes Billy such a good manager? And I always say, because the players know that if, if they're all up on top of a roof, and Billy said, jump off of this roof, they know that Billy would jump off with them. And I use this story to tell uh, that, to get that fact across. And uh, so I was telling the people up there why Billy was such a good manager. I said, I'll tell you another story. I said, he, he was down in Dallas last year, and he did such a good gun, they get a good... Uh, deal with that team down there, the turnaround gang, that they gave him a brand new rifle and he wanted to go hunting. So I said, well, uh, I'll take you down. I said, I know a guy down in, around San Antonio on a ranch outside of San Antonio in Lakey, Texas. He's a doctor and he's a good friend of mine. I'm pretty sure he'll let us go hunting on his ranch. So I, but I said, you're going to have to get up like four or five o'clock in the morning because it takes three or four hours to drive down there. He said, I don't care. I want to go deer hunting, you know, with my new rifle. So we drive all the way down there, you know, and I said, now you wait in the car and I'll go up and knock on the door and I'll, I'll ask the doctor if it's all right to, for us to go hunting. So he stayed in the car, I go up and knock on the door. The doctor comes to the door and he says, hey Mick, what are you doing down here? I said, well, I got Billy Martin, the new manager of the Rangers with me out in the car and we was wondering if we could go deer hunting on your ranch. He said, oh sure, anytime, you know, come on down. Uh, he said, and I started to walk off. He said, but you got to walk through, you got to leave the car there and walk through the barnyard. And he says, hey, by the way, would you do me a favor? I said, what's that? He said, uh, when you go through the barnyard, so you see that old mule standing over by the barn? I said, yeah. He said, would you shoot that mule for me? I said, oh, Christ, dog, we don't want to shoot your mule, you know. We come down here to hunt deer. 
He said, well, if you'd be doing me a big favor because he said, I just don't have the heart. I've had him a long time. So, uh, he, he's about 20 years old. He hasn't done any work for 10 years. I'm going to have to have him put away anyway. If you'd shoot him for me, you'd really be doing me a big favor. So I said, okay, I'll, we'll shoot the mule. So I'm walking back to the car. I think, I'm going to pull a joke on Billy, you know. So I run out to the car, and I yanked the door open. I said, give me my rifle. Billy goes, what's the matter? I said, we drove four hours to get down here to go deer hunting. This guy said, we can't go deer hunting. I'm going to shoot his mule. Billy goes, oh, my God. He said, don't do that. He's trying to grab the rifle back. You know, said, we'll get in jail. We'll get in trouble and everything. I said, give me the rifle. I finally get the rifle away from him. I go running out to the barn. <coughs> shoot the mule right in the neck, right? Mule falls over. About that time right behind me, I hear, bam, bam, bam. I turn around. There's Billy with his gun. I said, Billy, what are you doing? He said, I got three of these cows. They're really rocking in Boston, in Pittsburgh, PA, deep in the heart of Texas, and round the Frisco Bay, all over St. Louis, and down in New Orleans, all the cats gonna dance with sweet little 16, sweet little 16, she just got to have about a half a million. Famed autograph. Her wallet filled with pictures. She gets them one by one. Becomes so excited. Watch her look at her run, boy. Oh, mommy. I'm Texas this year. I'd rather lead the league in uh, runs batted in, home runs, and hitting. And that's my goal for this year. When I first came up, you know, there, there was so much pressure that was brought on by the media and Casey bragging on me. Everybody's expecting Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio all rolling, like I said, and it just didn't happen. I got booed a lot in Yankee Stadium because I, d I didn't really do as good as Joe DiMaggio until that year because he used to hit 323 or 330 every year, you know, and he was a great one, probably, the, they, they, they call him the greatest living baseball player, so I'm trying to take his place and I'm not doing it. And finally, in 1956, uh, I won the Triple Crown. But it wasn't that easy. I, can, I remember that I go into Boston, or the Yankees go into Boston, on the last three games of the, of the season. Me and Ted Williams both are hitting 348 or something like that. And, uh, of course, I got a couple of bunt hits. <laughs> I made sure I got some hits. And I hit a couple other balls pretty good. But mostly, uh, I, I think the two bunt hits is what really made him mad. But I, I can remember they asked him after it was over with. I ended up hitting 353, And I'm not sure what he ended up hitting that year, but it wasn't very far behind. And uh, they asked him, I uh, said, uh, what do you think about uh, Mantle out hitting you? He said, if I could run like him, I'd hit 400 every year. <laughs> They're really rocking in Boston and Pittsburgh, PA. And here we are at Yankee Stadium for Game 5 of the 1956 World Series. I guess one of the biggest games I ever played in uh, was in the World Series against the Dodgers in 1956 in Don Larson's perfect game. Uh, I can remember Magley was pitching a great game for the Dodgers, too. But I think, I'm not sure if I got the first hit or not, but I know that we, I got our first. I hit a home run off of Magley that was right down the line and just barely went right around the, uh, the foul pole in uh, Yankee Stadium. It says 296, but it was, it, was a, it was hit good enough. It would have been a home run in most ballparks. Later on, we scraped another run in with, I think, Hank Bauer got on and Andy Carey hit a double, something like that. We got two runs. And uh, then uh, all along about that time is when we started thinking about a no-hitter. But the funny thing about the game that I remember more than anything else is that during that game, Larson was trying to talk to everybody. on. A, you know, the baseball players have a superstition. If a pitcher's pitching a no-hitter, you don't say anything about it, you know. And I'm down in the corner getting a drink of water, and here he comes down there, Goonie Bird, we called him. He goes, hey, Mickey. And I said, what, Goonie? He said, wouldn't it be something if I pitched a no-hitter? And I said, come on, man, get out of here. I didn't want to talk about it, you know. And another thing I remember about that game was that you know, I made one of the best catches I've ever made. I wasn't known to be a, a great fielder or anything, but I could really run, you know, fast. 
And uh, Gil Hodges, was I remember, hit a ball that would have been way up in the upper deck in Abbott's Field. He probably hit it about 450 feet into left center field. There's a long drive into the gap in left center field. Ricky Mantle racing over, and he grabs it for a spectacular catch. How oh, about that? And it was one of the best catches I ever made, and it saved his no-hitter. Larson looks in. He takes a deep breath. The crowd is quiet. Larson throws, and it is strike three call. He's done. Don Larson has just pitched the only perfect game in World Series history. Oh, mommy, mommy, please me, I go. It's such a sight to see somebody steal the show. Oh, daddy, 1956, after the season was over, uh, the Yankees went to Japan. And uh, Jackie Jensen was scared to death of flying. I mean, even if we just was flying from New York to Boston, much less from San Francisco to uh, Guam to uh, Japan. And he had to go, he used to have to go to a hypnotist, you know, to uh, get on an airplane. He was so scared. And on this flight here, we had taken off, and oh, I guess we was about two hours into the flight, and we got into a storm. And, uh, of course, Jackie's up in the, the front of the plane, and then he's... Uh, stupor, you know, and he's, I guess he's just, he's relaxing because he was about half asleep, and Billy Martin's in the back of the plane, and uh, and we did get, we got in some rough stuff, and you know, you got to know that Jackie was a little bit out of it, I mean, or the hypnotist had done a good job, I guess. Anyway, Billy put on a Mae West vest in those days, and he, he let the air, you know, out of it, and he put on a uh, oxygen mask, and he goes running up there and he grabs Jackie and he said, Jackie, Jackie, get up, get up, we're going down. And of course the plane was in, in a storm, you know, and it was jumping up and down and going side to side. Jackie jumps up and he's trying to get his vest and his oxygen mask and everything on. All of a sudden he looks around and he sees nobody else is moving except Billy. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, I beg you, whisper to Mommy, it's all right with you. When I think about the longest ball or the hardest ball I ever hit, the one that they talk about all the time was the one in uh, Griffith Stadium, 565 feet. Griffith Stadium, uh, in case you don't know, uh, was not like these brand new ballparks. It wasn't three decks and uh, didn't have a dome on it or anything. It was a real old ballpark. And uh, the wind always seemed to blow out. It wasn't an easy ballpark to, uh, to hit home runs in, really, because right field uh, was about a 90-foot fence. and center field there was some trees out there that only Larry Doby I think was, and myself I hit two in those trees one day and on opening day against Pasquale and uh, Doby hit one in there so that it was not an easy ballpark to hit in but I hit this ball real high there was about a 30 or 40 mile an hour tailwind that day and it went over the auxiliary scoreboard in left field and it's, it was a long shot they measured it 565 anyway uh, I used to have a terrible habit the funny thing about the home run is that I, I had a terrible habit of running around the bases with my head down, you know, because I didn't want to embarrass the pitcher. I know he's embarrassed enough already, especially one that long, you know. And as I come around second, I'm getting ready to get to third base with my head down. I hear Frank Crosetti, the third base coach, holler, hey, look out. And I look up, and Billy Martin was on third when I hit the ball. He was tagged up like it was a long fly, and I almost ran into him. Of course, he's running on into the plates, you know, laughing, and, and I'm right behind him. And anyway, he told me, he said, that's the longest ball I've ever seen hit. But I think I hit two or three balls harder than that. I know I hit I hit a ball one time over the monuments in the old Yankee Stadium, uh, up in the center field, black seats. That was a long shot. Uh, the one in uh, USC, I think they said that would probably have gone over 600 feet. The USC ballpark wasn't really that big, you know. And when the ball went over the fence, I was already going around second, so I didn't see how far it did go. It went across a football field, too, uh, over a football field that w was adjutant to the uh, baseball field. So, uh, And then I hit one in San Francisco, too, where they said that only DiMaggio had hit, it, hit one before. And then I hit the facade off of Pedro Ramos one time uh, in Yankee Stadium. We was playing in Washington, and one of our pitchers hit some Washington player, I don't know, uh, on purpose. You could tell it was a knockdown. And the next inning, I'm leadoff man for the Yankees. And uh, I'm, I don't even think anything about it. You know, I go up to hit. 
But everybody in our bench and everybody on their bench and even some of the fans knew that Ramos was going to hit me because, uh, you know, to, to protect his own players. Well, I don't blame him, but I, don't, I didn't even thought about it, you know. We were always kind of friendly, you know. I mean, he was always wanting to run me a race, and he used to tease Pasquale because I hit a couple of long home runs off of Pasquale, and Pasquale would tease him about when I hit one off of him. Anyway, he hit me, and uh, I didn't say anything, you know. He, he didn't try to hit me in the head. He just... He just wanted to hit me because one of their guys got hit. Well, anyway, the next day around the cage, he comes up and he says, Mickey, I'm sorry, I have to do that, you know, something like that. And I said, hey, don't worry about it. I said, the next time the next time you do it, I'm going to drag a ball down the first baseline and run right up your back. He says, you would really do that? <laughs> anyway, the, the funniest thing about the whole story is the next time he pitched to me was in Yankee Stadium, and it's one of the balls I almost hit out of Yankee Stadium. I hit the facade. And he come, uh, he, he told me after the game, he said, I'd rather have you run up my back than hit one over the roof. <laughs> the hardest ball I think I ever hit uh, was in a night game against Kansas City, and Bill Fisher was pitching, and it was a um, like a ninth inning or twelfth inning or something. I know it was an, uh, a late inning game because it also won the game, but it was a line drive, and I thought it had a, sh a chance of making it. I'm, I'm like, this is the only time I think that I ever really uh, cared. You know, as long as it's a home run, is all I cared. You know. But this time I hit it. When I hit it, I thought this ball might go out of Yankee Stadium, and I was kind of watching it and hoping, you know. And it hit that facade, uh, maybe this far from the top, and bounced way back in toward the infield. But I think that was probably the hardest ball I ever hit. Sweet little sixteen, she just got to have about a half a million famed autographs. Her wallet filled. I've been getting some press about hitting long home runs, and the guys have been talking, you know, how uh, every once in a while I hit one 440 or something in the stadium there, you know, and everybody talk about it. One day uh, we're playing in uh, Cleveland, and I'm on the on-deck circle, and Joe Collins was hitting second, I guess, and he hit a long home run in the upper deck in the old municipal, well, it was still a municipal stadium, but he hit it kind of down the line in the upper deck. Anyway, when I shook hands with Joe as he came by, he said, go chase that one, big boy. Anyway, the next, uh, that time up, I hit one. There used to be a Chesterfield or a Lucky Strike or a Camel ad, a package stuck on the center, on the, uh, the mezzanine thing in the upper deck. And uh, I hit one to the left of it, which was probably about 70 feet further than Joe's ball. Anyway, when I had rounded the bases and I come back into the dugout, everybody was grinning and clapping and pointing at Joe, and Joe sitting over there, his cap kind of pulled down. I went over and said, what about that one, Joe? He said, go in your hat. You'll yeah, be rocking on bandstand, Philadelphia, PA, deep in the heart of Texas, and around the Frisco Bay. This is uh, next to the last home run I hit, number 535. Uh, that broke Jimmy Fox's record. But the real story behind it is uh, the Denny, that Denny McLean is the guy that threw it to me. Uh, Denny was pitching that day. He was about six to nothing ahead of us. He's having a great year. I think he won 31 games that year or something like that. Anyway, uh, I come up to hit, the, he thought, the last time up. It was my last time up in Detroit. And he called timeout, come walking up toward home plate, called Bill Freehand, the catcher, out behind the plate. And he was about from all five or six feet out in front of the plate, and he says, let's let him hit one. This is probably his last time in Detroit. Well, I heard him, you know, I heard him say that, but uh, you never know whether to believe him or not, you know. So when Freehand comes back by, I said, uh, did I hear what he said? He wants me to hit one. Freehand says, yeah, he's going to, I mean, he's not going to work on you. He's just going to throw you fastballs. I said, well, great, you know, but I'm still a little leery, you know. So, uh the first pitch he threw was right down the middle, and I took it, you know, and he goes, like, hey, what's the matter? So then, of course, I knew that he he really wanted me to hit one. So the next pitch, I swung a little too hard, and I got under it and popped it up as a foul ball in the back, and uh, Freehand just gets another ball and throws it back out to the to Denny. And the next pitch he uh, threw me, he, he really grooved it, you know, and I 
really hit one good uh, up in the upper deck. And I'm going around first and second, you know, and I kind of peek out at him. He's looking and grinning, you know. When I come around third, I look right at him, you know, and he, he kind of goes like, gives me a big wink, you know. And Pepitone is the next hitter. He was hitting behind me. And he sees what's going on, you know. So he comes up to hit. He's the next hitter. And uh, he looks out at Denny and he goes, hey, right in here, you know. Put me one right here. And the first pitch to Pepitone was right behind. He knocked him down. <laughs> team I ever saw in my life, and I really believe this, was the 61 Yankees. Uh, we hit 240 home runs, uh, and, I, and I don't think Whitey Ford won 25 and lost four or something like that. We had Louis Arroyo in the bullpen, and Stafford, and Tra Terry, and Dittmar. Everybody had a great year at the same time. That was the best team I ever saw. Our infield with Cletus Boyer at third, Kubek at shortstop, Bobby Richards at second, and Moose Scarron at first. Moose, Moose hit 27 home runs that year. Our catchers, Yogi and Blanchard and Howard, hit over 60, the three of them. And then, of course, me and Roger uh, had phenomenal years, you know, and uh, it was just a great team. I, I, I never got to see the 27 Yankees. Everybody says that was the greatest team ever. But it would have, had, it would have been a good series, I think, if we'd have got to play them. Well, when we come out of spring training in uh, 1961, Ralph had uh, told me that I was the leader, and I mean, I was really up, you know, like, like a high school football player, you know, you can get up. He came out, and he got me, and he took me over to the side, and he told me that he was going to probably hit Roger third, me fourth, because he thought, you know, that it would help Roger hitting third more than it would me hitting third in front of everybody. And... Uh, of course, I'd hit third all my life, but uh, he says, I'll tell you something. He said, you are our leader. You, whatever you do is what we're going to do this year. And he, he started making me uh, feel like that I really was the best there was. And uh, I took off and uh, like a ball of fire, you know, and uh, I, I really did kind of carry the club for a while. I don't think Roger hit a home run for a long time, and, and uh, I must have been... 10 ahead of him or something at one time. Anyway, all of a sudden he got on fire. And uh, like I said, that 61 ball club was just unbelievable. <laughs> uh, Yogi was as good a catcher as I ever saw. I'll tell you, he could come out from behind the plate on a bunt. He had a better arm than everybody thought he did. He would block the plate. Uh, he was a Yankee Stadium was made for him. He could hit that ball right down the right field line better than anybody I ever saw in my life. I saw him um, up in Boston one time bring Mickey McDermott in to knock him down, and a left-handed pitcher, and the first pitch he threw him was right at Yogi's head. And Yogi hit it like that and hit it right around the right field foul line. Fair, fair ball for a home run. I mean, he was unbelievable. He could hit a, hit a ball and no matter where you threw it. Most all the stories you hear about Yogi, uh, Joe Gargiola, made him up. You know, Gargiola made a name by making up Yogi Berra stories. I've heard Yogi say some funny things. I was standing with him in front of the uh, Gold Ocean Mile in spring training, and he really did look good. He had on a like a Hawaiian flowered shirt, a pair of slacks, and a pair of uh, like those tong 
uh, shoes that they wear down in Florida without any socks. He really did look good. And a little old lady come up to him and said, Yogi, you look cool today. And he said, you don't look too hot yourself. Anyway, somebody hollered at him and said, hey, yo, what time is it? He goes, uh, well, you mean right now? <laughs> the other day I was with uh, Billy and, and his coaches in Billy's office up at Yankee Stadium, and Art Fowler, Billy's uh, pitching coach, said that Yogi was uh, 23 years old before he learned how to wave bye-bye. This was one of my worst days that I ever have, I guess. Uh, I'd, I'd uh, struck out two or three times with men in scoring position, and I dropped a pop fly. Uh, Bob Turley was the pitcher. I never will forget that. Of course, he, he, he was a nice guy. He came over and said, forget it, you know. I mean, I really, I feel bad. I didn't mind striking out. I'm getting used to that by now, you know. But uh, to drop a pop fly to let the winning run in is uh, really bad. Anyway. I go right straight to my locker, you know, I throw my glove and my cap down. I'm sitting in my, on my stool in front of my locker with my head in my hands. I, it was so bad that the reporters didn't even come in. They knew I was going to be pretty hot, you know. And uh, I was just sitting there holding my head. And I could feel somebody looking at me. And I looked up out from under my hands, and here's this little kid standing there. And it was Yogi's son. Yogi's locker's right next to mine. And uh, I looked down and I said, Hey, Timmy, how you doing? I said, what's, what, what's, what's the matter? He's looking at me really funny, you know? And he looked me right now and he said, boy, you stunk. And I mean, Yogi jumped out of his locker and gave him a boot in the butt, kicked him about four feet over there, and he went over and got him and shook him and took him into the player's lounge in there where he couldn't say anything else. We're gonna twist it, twist it, twist it So we tear the house down Probably one of the questions I get more than anything else is like, what about Roger Maris and yourself? You know, in 1961, when Roger hit the 61 home runs, there was a lot written that we didn't like each other, that we argued a lot or fought a lot or something. That's the farthest thing from the truth. In fact, we lived together in New York. When you think about Roger Maris, the first thing you think about is home runs. And it is the single hardest thing to do in sports, I think. And to hit 61 of them is really hard. But in, outside of the home runs, the fact that he hit 61 home runs, nobody else ever has, Roger was one of the greatest players I've ever seen. I mean, he, uh, he was the best, as, as good a feeler as I ever saw. He had a great arm. He never made a mistake, like throwing the ball too high and letting the guy take an extra base. He was a great base runner. I never saw him make a mistake on the bases. He's always in the game. He's a good, good team man. Guys liked him. I mean... We had an off day in Baltimore, and Bob Turley lived in Baltimore, and he invited everybody over to his house for, a, you know, like a little cookout, steak cookout, and we had some beer and stuff, you know. And I used to, no matter what happened, I used to always say I was the Oklahoma State champion at it, no matter what somebody said, you know. like, And we were sitting around talking about, around the pool, and Rogers telling me how great, was, you know, he was really an all-around athlete. He was a great football player in Fargo, and baseball and basketball and I guess he's a great swimmer I can't even swim but I told him I was the Oklahoma State champion and I'd like to race him across Turley's pool well I'd go I get Whitey on the side and I said hey slick whenever when we dive in the water get that that thing over the uh, pool sweep and stick it in there and I'll grab a hold of it and you run me down to the other end so he says okay so we get we get out there and we get in this stance you know like the Olympics do you know dive dive in the stance just as I dive in, Whitey hands me the pole, you know, and he runs me down to the other end. But he wasn't running straight. He was running kind of sideways, and he was I was bouncing off the side of the pool. Anyway, we be, he, he gets me down there a good 10 feet ahead of Roger, and I jump up on the edge of the pool, and I'm sitting there. When Roger gets there, I'm sitting there knocking the water off of my face, and shaking my hair, and he looks up, and he says, how the hell did you get here? You know, like he knows he can beat me, you know. Anyway, he, he, he doesn't have any idea what happened, and then everybody starts laughing, you know, and giggling about it. Pretty soon he notices that the whole left side of my arm is kind of like almost bleeding, you know, from Whitey pulling me against the sideways. He said, you son of a gun. He, then he knew that I didn't really swim down there. I 
I can remember that year, uh, once it got way into the season where it looked like that we both had a chance of breaking Babe Ruth's record, um, almost, they call us the M&M &M boys, and almost every every paper the next day after a game, I don't care if Kubek or Richardson or Cletus Boyer or Moose, Elston, Yogi, any of those guys could have hit a home run that won a game, and it would still say what the M&M &M boys did in the headlines, you know, and the the players were so good about it. They made it. They made it easy on us because they would tease us instead of getting mad about it. You know, saying, "Hey, look, I, I hit a home run," and they put the M and M boys. Up. Uh, they would come around and say, "Hey, what the M and M boys do today?" You know, I mean, they they tease us a lot, and uh, they took it really good. They made it. They made it really a lot easier, especially after I fell out of the race for Roger. I mean, they helped him do it. The whole team did. Come on, baby. Let's do I didn't get to finish the season that year. I, I had a real bad cold. We was in Boston, and one of the announcers uh, told me on the way back home to New York, uh, said, uh, you know, those antibiotics that you're taking are doing you no good. said, I know a doctor that you might be able to go to that can give you a, a shot that can get rid of that cold for you, and you'll feel better, you know, and be able to play better. And uh, so I said, well, I'd try anything because I want to stay in the race. You know, I was only like two or three home runs behind Roger at that time, or maybe, yeah, I think three. Anyway, uh, I go to this doctor and I get a shot in the hip and it turned bad. I had to go down and have it lanced. So I spent the last, you know, like a week and a half or so, I don't even know exactly what it was, watching. And that made the pressure twice as bad on Roger because there's only one guy now that they can come to. And uh, for him to go ahead and, and do that, I think it's just unbelievable. I was so proud of it. And, and, and the way he acted, you know, like he never, he never, you know, like run around the bases jumping up and down or hit a home run and stood at home plate and watched it go out like they do nowadays. He hit a home run. He ran around the bases just like he always did. I even cried, you know, when he hit his 61st home run. Maris swings, and there goes fans, and that one's gone. Maris has done it. Just set the record for home runs in a single season, and the fans are going just crazy. Listen to him. When 
he hit his 61st home run. He came into the dugout, and they're applauding. I mean, this is something that's only happened once in baseball, right? And the people are applauding. They're wanting him to come back out. He wouldn't come. The, the players had to push him back out for him to come out and take a bow. To have an asterisk behind his record, I think, is stupid. Uh, I don't care. There's been a lot of guys tried since then. Nobody's ever even come close. Well, Roger uh, hasn't been selected for the Hall of Fame yet, but uh, to me, he's as good as there ever was. I have four boys of my own, and if I could pick somebody for those four boys to grow up to be like, it would be Roger. Out of all these trophies that I have here, I think the one, the one thing that I treasure more than anything else is this ball that Roger gave me. It's got his picture on it. And he wrote on it, he says, to Mickey, the greatest of them all, best always, Roger Maris. And I really treasure that. I can't, uh, I don't hit the ball when I need to. I can't steal second when I need to. I can't go from first to third or score from second on uh, base hits. And I just think it's time that I uh, quit trying. I think the biggest thrill I've ever had uh, was in 1969. They declared Mickey Mantle Day at Yankee Stadium. There was like 69,000 or 71,000 people showed up. I don't think the stadium may even hold that many now. The magnificent Yankee, the great number seven, Mickey Mantle. When I walked into this stadium 18 years ago, I felt much the same way I do right now. I don't have words to describe how I felt then or how I feel now. But I'll tell you one thing, baseball was real good to me. And playing 18 years in the Yankee Stadium for you folks is the best thing that could ever happen to a ball player. At that time, they had only retired numbers three, four, and five for Ruth and Gehrig and DiMaggio. And uh, for a kid from Oklahoma, like I said, uh, to have his number retired with those three guys was uh, the biggest, biggest thrill you could ever have. I, I remember they rode me around Yankee Stadium that day on a golf cart and was riding around uh, Danny, the guy that was driving me in the golf cart, that one of the ground crew guys came up about the same time I did in 51. I'd known him all my life, you know. I t we got about to center field or a little past center field. I told him, I says, Danny, you know what? I said, this makes me feel like Dolly Parton's little baby when it's nursing. Is this all for me? Everybody says to me, he said, well, how much do you think you'd make now if you was still playing? And I like what Joe DiMaggio said, you know, he said, uh, he'd go up and knock on the door at the George Steinbrenner opened the door, he'd say, Hi, partner. I always liked that.
I don't know for what reason, but for some reason or other, I seem to be more popular now than I've ever been in my life. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the bubble gum card craze or what, but autograph seekers are just seem to come from everywhere. Uh, I know that uh, my bubble, I got one bubble gum card that sells for $4,500 now. And uh, it's just, uh, it, nothing seems to stop them, you know. I mean, uh, not too long ago, uh, I remember I was, uh, they thought I'd, I was having a heart attack on an airplane. They called the paramedics, you know, and they came to the door of the plane. And when it got there, they had put oxygen in on me uh, coming in. Uh, I had a real bad cold. I know that. It was almost like walking pneumonia or something. And uh, I couldn't hardly breathe on the plane, and I was getting a little scared myself. So uh, I asked the stewardess, you know, what what do you do if somebody has a heart attack? And she looked at me, and she said, my God, I said, you better go sit down. I said, I'll give you some oxygen, and she did. Anyway, she they called ahead, and whenever the plane got into Dallas, uh, the paramedics were at the door, you know, and they put me on a stretcher and put the thing in my nose and the oxygen on my face. Anyway, uh, they're pulling me out of there, and one of the... Uh, some guy standing outside the door there says, hey, that's Mickey Mouse. Hey, Mick, would you sign this for me? He's got a piece of paper and a pen or something. Anyway, they go ahead and take me to the hospital and check me all over and everything. And uh, so the next day they said they was going to give me an angiogram, you know, to uh, see how my heart was and everything. Anyway, uh, thinking of, I got to thinking about that guy wanting an autograph, you know. Uh, and uh, as far as he knows, it looks like I'm dying. And uh, I, th I thought that uh, I made up a story for the New York press. I, kn I was going to New York right away, you know. I told them that night that I dreamed I died and went to heaven. And I finally got in to see God, and God said, Well, Mick, I'm sorry, but we can't keep you up here because of the way you acted on earth. But he said, uh, Would you do me a favor? And I said, What's that, God? And he said, uh, Would you do, uh, before you go back, would you sign those two dozen baseballs there for me? <laughs> Oh, and I thought that was really funny.